All right, so welcome to Eat, Move, Think, the show about optimal wellness brought to you by MedCan. Wow. Oh, I was practicing. Oh. <laughs> okay, ready? <clears throat> welcome, welcome, welcome to Eat, Move, Think, think. the show about optimal, optimal, optimal wellness brought, brought to you, you by MedCan. Med yeah, that, this is extremely good. Thank you. Do you think traveling is healthy? I don't know. Like, on the one hand, it takes a lot of preparation. You know, you yeah. make sure you have to get airfare and hotels or rental and make sure that you have your vaccinations. And, and then you get to the airport and you find your nine-year-old's passport is expired. Or that you didn't buy a visa for the country you're going to and you yeah. should have. <laughs> like, so it can be stressful. So we are learning a lot lately about how new experiences and new connections are are as important for our health as, you know, the things that we talk about when we talk about eat, move and think. And there is real research about the benefits of traveling. It can improve heart health. It can lower stress. That one we know. But it also can make you happier and even increase your creativity. OK, you've convinced me. Let's let's go. So is now a good time to request that time off? Next stop, Punta Cana. <laughs> I'm Jasmine Ratch. I'm Chris Shulgin. We're the producers of Eat, Move, Think. So in this episode of Eat, Move, Think, we're talking about how, yeah, travel is good for you. But how do you travel safely and stay as healthy as possible? Because sometimes traveling to places can expose you to some pretty serious conditions and lead to some unhealthy habits. So in this episode, MedCan Associate Medical Director and Clinical Director of Travel Medicine, Dr. Aisha Khatib, joins MedCan's Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Peter Knorr. They'll draw from their experiences as MDs and as travel lovers to give you the guide to staying healthy and safe on your trip. They have some great tips for every step of the way, from the planning stages to the best way to zap your jet lag after you get home. Well, let's get right into it. Here is Dr. Peter Knorr. Well, hi, everybody, and welcome back to Eat, Move, Think. Hi, Isha. How are you doing? And more more importantly, where in the world are you right now? Because you love to travel. I know, Peter. I'm in between trips, actually. I just got back to Toronto, where I was actually in Muskoka at the MedCan uh, Clinic in Muskoka this last week. when We wrapped it up there, and it was great and successful and beautiful to be up there during the fall. How about yourself? I hear you're traveling right now. Yeah, I'm actually talking to you today from Cork, Ireland, of all places. I have uh, one of my three sons is in med school here, so we're going back and forth quite a bit. And I was going to start by saying, you know, the trip here has traditionally been pretty easy, but this time was a bit of a disaster. They had a mechanical issue in Toronto. The, the plane got oh, actually no. canceled. And so the next flight was leaving at like 1 a.m. Just one of those travel experiences that unfortunately, you know, didn't go according to plan. So maybe we can we can talk a little bit about how do we kind of minimize the stress that people undergo because travel is amazing. When you get there, it's amazing. And and sometimes even the journey can be nice and fun, but there are times that it can be not everything that you thought it was going to be. And that's where planning comes in for folks that haven't heard you in the past. You've been on a number of Eat, Move, Think episodes. Maybe you can just go through your your role at MedCan. Sure. Thanks, Peter. And uh, yeah, we'll get to your jet lag later then. Because <laughs> um, I'm sure it's what, two o'clock though? What time is it there? Yeah, three o'clock. Three o'clock. All right. Well, so I'm Dr. Aisha Khatib, and I am the clinical director of travel medicine at MedCan. So I am a travel doctor. And as I know, it's an unusual title, but I am a physician of other specialties as well. So I've trained in family and emergency medicine, as well as a certification in travel medicine and infectious diseases and tropical medicine as well. So I see people who are going off to travel. I do pre-travel consultations. And I also see the post-travel returned ill travelers um, and the ones that I can say, see, I told you so. <laughs> But no, I try not to say that. But that, no, it's that can seriously be um, an issue and something to remember. There are doctors and specialists available who specialize in post-travel care. So my other role is I'm just recently inducted as a fellow of the International Society of Travel Medicine. And I also am a voting member of CATMAT. So CATMAT is the Committee to Advise on Tropical Medicine and Travel. But we're an external advisory board to the Public Health Agency of Canada. 
So we work specifically when there are issues that come up with travel advisories, such as things like COVID or Ebola outbreaks or immunization specifically for travelers. Uh, That's our role in creating those guidelines. And that's available on the canada.gc.ca website, all those guidelines there. So I'm busy and I love it. And in between all of that, I do often like to travel for research, of course. (laughs) Purely for research purposes. Yeah. (laughs) Purely for research. Not not because you love it. I love it. (laughs) It's my passion, that's for sure. That's great. And I think if people Google you, they may end up seeing uh, the, the that last year you actually delivered a baby in the air. That was pretty crazy. Well, I, I figure if you're on enough airplanes, <laughs> you're bound to experience a medical emergency on one. And I was actually on my way to Uganda for a tropical medicine course. And they announced, you know, that dreaded is there a doctor on the plane? And of course, I, you know, sprang into action with my emergency medicine brain and uh, said, you know, I'm a doctor and I headed over and essentially I was expecting like a heart attack or something like this. But no, I came upon lady, a lady who was actively delivering. So by the time I got there, I mean, there was and it ended up being a team, but I ended up having to deliver a baby at 32,000 feet in the air over the Nile in Africa. (laughs) And uh, baby and mom are fine. And I think it was a great story. She ended up naming the baby after me. So Miracle Aisha, which is uh, fantastic. And yes, it did go viral. So you can and you can definitely Google me and read the story. That's great. You cannot make that stuff up for sure. No, no. But honestly, I think that was like the epitome of my career, the epitome of being a travel doctor. And as you know, that year, I had actually done all my research on air travel and the safety of traveling on an airplane during the pandemic. And lo and behold, here I was, you know, experiencing the epitome of of travel medicine during a pandemic on an airplane. So it was quite the experience. Wow, that's great. Yeah, so let's, we'll get to that. Why don't we kind of thinking about it chronologically and, you know, from the planning of the trip to whether it's by air or other modes of transportation and then at your destination, what is, you know, how do we optimize that? And then coming back and follow-ups, as you mentioned, sometimes we bring things back with us. So it often takes quite a bit of planning and just, you know, working through trying to, you know, make connections and things. Sometimes it's really challenging and it can be exhausting. It, maybe it's worth it in the end. So maybe we can mention just a little bit about the benefits of traveling, the health benefits of traveling, and why is all this front end work actually worth it in the end? Yeah, so that's a really good point. There actually has been evidence showing that travelers actually benefit physically, cognitively, and socially from traveling. So there is benefit. There was a survey actually done showing that 77% actually believe that their health improves after a vacation, and roughly 80% believe that their vacations and the activity undertaken result in greater productivity, energy, and focus. And if we actually look at the non-communicable disease health benefits, there was one study that was taken from Destination Healthy Agent where it showed that women actually who vacationed every six years or less had a significantly higher risk of developing a heart attack or coronary death compared to those who vacationed at least twice a year. So so Peter, this is just a plug for me to say I need more vacation days for my health. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Uh, <laughs> but if you break it down, right, there's physical benefits. And you yourself, uh, Peter, you are in Ireland right now. You were telling me you're much more active there. You're surfing, you're hiking, you're going horseback riding while you're still maintaining your work hours there. So you're, you're generally getting more fresh air, you're getting more exercise, you're more active than you technically would be in Toronto. So there's benefits there. There's benefits with the cognitive aspect, right? You're experiencing new things. You're creating, you know, new neurons and memories and experiences. And you're creating what we call cognitive resilience. So this is actually a protective factor as you get older, because these new creations, these new synapses that you're creating protect against things like dementia and Alzheimer's. This has actually been proven. On top of that, you're experiencing, you know, social connections, right? You said it yourself, you feel like one of the locals and they treat you like one of the locals. But understanding that cultural difference, understanding, it really enriches our lives. And there's so many benefits that go beyond just 
I'm going on a vacation because I need to de-stress. And that's just another point, actually, is just the stress release um, from these vacations is is an important outlet for people. Um, and we know that stress can cause a lot of medical issues as well. So, uh, you know, I would say it... Um, Travel is a medication. Travel is a is a medicine, you know. And I think that if, if it were up to me, I would prescribe it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's terrific. And so, you know, obviously, we want to reduce stress. And as I said, sometimes the front end until you get there can be a little stressful. And and sometimes when you arrive, you know, if it's a new place, potentially new languages, can't read the signs. So a lot of that we we can pre manage before we actually ever get there. I have three sons. My other son is leaving this week for two weeks to Columbia. And he actually oh. he actually came through your clinic. So he he, he oh, went through, got his him. vaccinations. Yes, yes. And so, but maybe you can say, okay, if it was something like tropical Columbia, for example, versus maybe something in more like in traveling to Europe, more of a temperate climate. Absolutely, Peter. So when we talk about risk in travel medicine, it really refers to the possibility of any harm during the course of a planned trip. And some risk can be completely unavoidable, and some are avoidable. And obviously, we talk about vaccine preventable disease, and we will get to vaccines as probably the most avoidable, um, depending on the risk of disease, and of course, the protective efficacy of the vaccine. But actually, what we don't realize is non disease risks account for a much higher percentage of death among travelers than infectious diseases. And it is something to prepare for and understand depending on where you're going. So do you actually know the number one cause of of death um, in travelers overseas, Peter? I would say motor vehicle accidents. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it's motor vehicle accidents, right? Things like maybe not wearing a seatbelt when they're traveling or not, you know, wearing a helmet if they're on a motorcycle, things that you would do without even thinking about here when you're there you're kind of in a different environment you're kind of disengaged um, and you're more likely to do risky behaviors and when we talk about the risk assessment of where somebody may be going it, it's 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 complex you know it's not as simple as you're going here here's some vaccines the preparation and what we look at as a travel provider is you know we look at your medical history what is your prior experience where are you going you know what season are you going in you know is your son going to Columbia is he going is it going to be cold or is it going to be warm is it the dry season or is it going to be the wet season what activities are they doing are they going for work are they going for adventure you know are they going for ecotourism what type of accommodation is he glamping or is he backpacking and staying in tents so what it comes down to is preparation it's knowledge acquisition right and then kind of preparing yourself for unexpected things that can arise and being flexible understanding that yes things aren't going to go your way or the way that you expected and that's okay but protecting yourself in a way that you can remain stay safe and healthy while these things happen the best way to do that obviously to read about the destination that you're going to and there's you know there's podcasts there's books that are available on destination but also to understand the risks, you could also visit a specialist. Like I'm a travel physician. I'm constantly being updated on changes going out throughout the world. I have up-to-date information on, you know, what is playing out somewhere. And so I can help guide you and provide travel reports. Other great sources are, is the CDC travel website. Obviously, CatMat has good guidelines and, and recommendations for certain countries. Um, there's other resources on line um, such as uh, the CDC Yellow Book. Um, all of these, you know, are great sources. The CDC actually has a great uh, traveler's website where you can actually click, type in where you're going, the destination where you're going, um, and it'll kind of show you what vaccines you rec- uh, recommended, but it'll show you kind of other risk factors, right, like security issues or other things like that. And they actually also have a packing list that they recommend. So that is actually something that that's quite nice. And that's something that we can help with. And, and I can, I'm happy to go into some of those details as well. So why don't we jump into that? I mean, some situations, some countries can be, you know, more stable than others. You know, as we're seeing what's happening in the Middle East this particular period, obviously Mm -hmm. hard to predict that three weeks ago, right? So that, so those sort of, so that, that would change your risk tolerance significantly if you had been planning to, to go into some of those areas. And, 
I know when I was doing, uh, I, I ran an international relief agency for, for a couple of years, and uh, we were constantly checking what we called the hotspots websites, where, you know, they would pick up on global hotspots on almost on a daily basis, everything from, you know, pickpocketing to, you know, uh, various sort of terrorism attacks or threats, those sort of things. So, so there's the health side. There's also just the overall safety side as well. So obviously doing your homework is really Listen, important. So that's the first step is figuring out where you're going, when you're going, you know, what you're going to be doing. And based on that information, then we can kind of go on to the next steps to kind of help prepare you as to what would be um, necessary. So obviously the first and foremost thing we talk about is vaccines, right? And when we talk about vaccines and we review vaccines, we first of all make sure that you're up to date on your routine vaccinations, things like your tests and your shingles and your pneumonia vaccines, which are important to just as your baseline health that we would protect you for here. Then uh, we look at things like our what we call our recommended travel vaccines for certain destinations. So for example, people traveling to Southeast Asia would be very high risk of typhoid, right? Or salmonella typhoid is, a, is, is you can get through contaminated food and water. The other thing then we would go on to is look at required vaccinations. Okay. And so for example, Columbia. So the yellow fever vaccine is actually a required vaccine. Um, and it is actually one of the only vaccines that is on what we call international health regulations. And that's one of the reasons why it's only offered through travel vaccines and through designated travel sites. It's not given out through pharmacists or through your family doctor because it is a complex vaccine. It's a live vaccine with a lot of side effect profiles. There's two reasons to get the yellow fever vaccine, which is a disease transmitted by mosquitoes. And don't get me started on mosquitoes. <laughs> They're the deadliest creature alive. But uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. But you would want the vaccine to protect yourself if you're going to an area, okay, that has the yellow fever. But you actually would also potentially need it for international health regulations. So for example, okay, Kenya has yellow fever, okay? Tanzania, which is a bordering country in Africa, does not have yellow fever. However, they have the mosquito that can transmit yellow fever, okay? So if you're traveling on safari and you're going from Kenya into Tanzania, they will ask you at the border for proof of vaccination because they don't want you bringing yellow fever into Tanzania to start an outbreak, Okay, and this also applies to things like other countries in sub-Saharan Africa and subtropical South America. There are lots of countries that don't have yellow fever in Africa or South America, but some do. And so I've heard stories of people, for example, flying out of Brazil, where they have yellow fever, never was asked upon entry, flying through Costa Rica, where they don't have yellow fever and being denied entrance. Or other worse things, being vaccinated at the border. And that's the last thing you would want, right? There are other required vaccines, such as polio and meningitis vaccines, depending on where you're going. The Hajj, for example, has a requirement for meningitis vaccine a lot in the last five years. Polio for certain countries, if you're traveling there for more than four weeks. So again, the itinerary, where you're going, what you're doing, all really plays into it. And it's and it's complex, right? Because we're not looking at these individual vaccines in its nutshell. We have to look at interactions with other diseases and whatnot. I would have to say my biggest push is... And, and the thing that they probably get a, a misconception, a misunderstanding about is that flu vaccine, the influenza vaccine, because we know that there's seasonal variation in flu. So right now we're in the Northern Hemisphere, we're entering into our flu season, the Southern Hemisphere is coming out of their flu season. So someone's like, okay, well, I'm going to Australia. They're in their summer. I don't need my flu shot. Couple things. First of all, the people you're traveling with are probably sometimes going to be carriers of flu and you could probably get it from fellow travelers just within airports and crowds and whatnot. The other thing to remember is flu influenza actually circulates in the tropics year round. There's no seasonal variation. And there was one study that we looked at um, where we looked at return travelers with fever at the, this is at the Tropical Disease Unit in the Toronto General. And we found that 25% of travelers actually returned back in the off season and were diagnosed with influenza. It's something to think about as a physician, but also as a traveler. And, you know, it's one of my 
one of my advocacies, I really want to get influenza vaccine available year round for travelers. And for this reason, right? But I mean, it's important. And I think that's one of the best ways to protect yourself is making sure you're up to date with things like influenza and your COVID vaccine as well. And I mean, a simple vaccine could protect your trip. Yeah, that's a great overview. And obviously, very customized to where you are. So the big takeaways, these are all very important areas of travel protection. And you you do want to actually visit with a professional to help you navigate what, what you do need and what you don't need. So absolutely. What about medications yeah. for people in the tropics? There's Montezuma's Revenge or sort of like the E. coli diarrhea. Do you recommend that people take up a, a, a course or two with them just in case? Yeah. So if you talk about traveler's diarrhea, you know, up to 40% of people will get traveler's diarrhea at some point in their travels. And sometimes the issue with that is the irritable bowel syndrome or the post-infectious sequelae that can last up to two years in people. There is benefit to treat people for traveler's diarrhea to to decrease the risk of complications later. But there's different approaches to it, right? So when we do the travel consult, we look at that, we look at someone's, you know, history, are they more susceptible to getting really ill if they have diarrhea for someone who has diabetes, for example, if they have diarrhea, they can get quite sick. And then we look to see, you know, what are ways that you can decrease it? So we talk about loperamide, and that decreases the risk and the, you know, slows down the diarrhea. There's things like bismuth subsalicylate, right, or peptobismol, which is a non-bacterial antibiotic that can be used. And the, actually, the Canadian Family Physician has a really great infographic on, on treating traveler's diarrhea and, and how to approach it. And we also talk about, you know, things like electrolytes, so staying hydrated, what are the types of food that you can and can eat you you know we used to say bottled water stick with bottled water or boiled water but we're now moving away from plastic bottles around the world as well because of the impact on the environment and so a lot of places and hotels and are are now providing filtered water in glass bottles and and understanding that that's safe you know if they're saying it's safe to drink it's safe to drink like this has been okay and if you're not sure boil the water you know there's chlorine tablets there's filters there's there's life straws available but the best thing you could do is boil it that'll pretty much kill everything the other thing is jet lag common for business travelers the best way to to come get over jet lag is actually to increase your light exposure during the early morning okay that's probably the fastest way and there's actually apps for jet lag that help you do that and hydration uh, hydration is a huge one that can help with that as well and maybe just a word just as as covid is starting to come back on the scene as we expected it would as you know, sort of as time with uh, influenza season being here uh, i sometimes get asked about the same sort of the the pocket prescription for paxlovid just in case i should come down with covid maybe just a quick comment on paxlovid Paxlovid is a great medication. Okay, it's a great antiviral that we can use if you have COVID. It, we are working on trying to get it available for, for, for travelers right now. It's still, unfortunately, we can't pr- prescribe it beforehand. But it often is available depending on where you're going. Like in the United States, you can get it at pharmacies and overseas, you may be able to source it even here in Canada. But in Canada, you need proof that you have COVID. So unfortunately, we, you can't carry it with you at this point. But it is something to think about accessing but again then the best prevention beyond that is to to get vaccinated to decrease your risk of a severe disease you know potentially masking in really crowded environments um, all of these will decrease your risk of, of getting COVID in the first place but then being prepared to kind of how would you treat that if you needed to and often it would be symptomatic management um, with ibuprofen or um, acetaminophen or other decongestants as needed I think the other thing that kind of brings me to is sometimes you can't get those medications where you are, right? And you can't get certain treatments where you are. And so that's when travel insurance becomes a really important aspect of your travel, even travel to the United States. I don't think people remember that we're not covered when we travel to the United States, right? So if something happens to you down there, you're going to be paying out of pocket for it. So even remembering to get travel insurance for the, for, for the US is very important. I've heard so many things of people and friends family members who've gone down, they've had a stroke, or they've had a heart attack, or they've, you know, broken something, and they needed surgery, and they weren't 
they had to pay out of pocket for it. And it's exuberant, these costs. I can't emphasize enough the importance of travel insurance and not just, you know, I have it on my credit card, but looking at coverage for medical coverage, right? And often that's the that's the, the caveat is looking to see to make sure that you have medical insurance coverage. And the other thing we talk about is looking to see what coverage you have for something called repatriation. And you know very well about this, Dr. Nord, you were you were a flying doctor and one of your one of your past lives. Um, and you'd go in and get these people out. But the idea is something happens, is the insurance coverage going to cover you to bring you back home? Okay, and and I you know I have a story in Nepal that you know we were hiking. One well, no, we were working in Nepal there um, with Himalayan healthcare, and one of my nurses actually we were walking back to the village, and she fell off the cliff. Like she misstepped, and she fell off the cliff and dropped twenty feet, shattered her her arm, and I remember literally spending the entire day the next day on the phone with like travel insurance and helicopters and and whatnot trying to get them to come to get her out to get her evacuated but they wouldn't because her travel credit card didn't have enough high enough balance to cover for her insurance and they needed that deposit paid because she didn't have that that caveat covered in her insurance so you know we needed to make sure those funds were available before the helicopter would even come out to get her and you know time can be really precious in some of these situations um so something to think about for sure you may not have internet access you may not have communication you're not going to have a sat phone so you have to sort of think through it again where you're going to be and, and that would fall under the risk uh management part that you're mentioning and and just on that uh, two footnotes number one at MedCan, our dedicated care physicians, so the family physicians looking after our patients, uh, part of their role is to expedite that repatriation. So our docs can connect with docs locally and uh, encourage that, you know, we provide whatever medical information is required to get that person safely home. So that, that's one footnote. Second footnote, MedCan has just joined with an organization, which is a number of, I believe it's 72 clinics across the U.S. under the banner of ROMD, R-O-A-M-D. And these are all MedCan quality concierge clinics that we will see their patients if, they, if they're needed when they're in Toronto. And if any of our clients are traveling and, uh, and get ill, they can actually access this network as well. So we're trying to minimize risk, even as you said, in, in the United States or, or elsewhere by... Um, and you know, looking after providing a kind of a very comprehensive basket of services for all of our clients uh, at MedCan. And then maybe I can jump back to air travel because that's been with COVID, obviously no one was traveling. And then there were some situations where we could travel, obviously. And you mentioned, you know, one of the areas that we can um, consider high risk is airports. And so maybe a couple of comments. I know you spent quite a bit of time looking at the research on air travel and safety of air travel. And I know that's a common question that I often get. Yeah, absolutely. First of all, there's a lot of lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic, right, in regards to air travel. And I think the public really realized and it created a lot of awareness about cross-border infections, right? And emerging infections that can occur. Because in the beginning, back in early 2020, this COVID-19, when it was emerging, it was in my court. You know, it was a travel disease. You know, I was watching very closely as it was spreading from Wuhan to Taiwan. And all of a sudden I had, you know, cautions about traveling to Thailand. And then I could see it spreading. For me, it was more, I was advising my travelers where they were and and people coming back. So I think that's one of the things is that COVID really illustrated the role of a traveler as a sentinel for infectious diseases. Okay, and this is not new, but it is something that really impacted the aviation industry hugely. And right, we saw this had probably the the most unprecedented decline in history um, because of COVID and the aviation shutting down. Like they had a they had a sixty percent shutdown, right? Like that's unheard of. That's more than you know the oil crisis or the Gulf crisis or nine eleven. Um, and this is going to take recovery. Although we're seeing that recovery is fast, and things that are allowing us to recover, well, obviously vaccines and therapeutics have made a huge and significant role in reopening society and accelerating the resumption of travel, right? So I think that's one of the other first and foremost things is the importance of getting vaccinated will protect yourself and it'll also protect others when you're traveling.
traveling. The other thing to think about is the actual airplane, right? And we talk about kind of gate to gate. When you're in the airport, when you're in the airplane, what is your risk in the airport? What is your risk in the airplane? And actually, modern day airplanes actually are quite safe. They've got good filtration systems. They've got HEPA filtration. They've got air circulating combined with fresh air um, quite frequently on the airplane. So the air being circulated is quite safe. And the the highest risk is really going to be pretty much people two rows and two rows behind you. So obviously, if there's someone sitting next to you and and coughing (laughs) and hacking, then and maybe you might want to put on a mask. And part of it is maybe they shouldn't be traveling, right? And I think that's another huge thing. And this is a huge thing I see is people who are sick, who are traveling, and you're putting other people at risk, right? And I think that's one of the other take home points is if you aren't feeling well, you really shouldn't be traveling because you could be putting other passengers at risk. And that's where the risk comes down to. It's not the actual airplane itself. It's it's passengers who may be sick. And that being said, when you're in close quarters and security lineups, um, and crowds, that's when your risk is going to be highest when you're traveling. But just gauge the situation, right? You don't have to wear a mask in all in every situation, but it will protect you in crowded places where there's decreased ventilation, where there are clearly people who are symptomatic, and often you won't know. So if you don't know and you don't want to risk getting sick, safe to be better. Um, it's better to be safe and just wear, you know, a mask. And we usually say something at least like a KN95 is going to be more protective than just your simple um, um, surgical mask. Perfect. Yeah, I think we, we couldn't uh, have this episode progress without a comment like that, because that's as we expected, COVID is now coming back on. And not just COVID, RSV, respiratory syncytial virus, uh, as well as influenza, all coming on at the same time. And for certain populations, RSV actually can have a more significant morbidity attached to it than even COVID, especially for for children. So just starting to to wrap up. So, you know, misconceptions, any any big mistakes that you you see commonly or any kind of things that you you see on a regular basis that you'd like to address and, and correct at this time? Yeah, so I mean, I think, you know, one of the things is that people don't realize that travel vaccines are are separate than the routine vaccines. And they often think that they've had certain vaccines as part of their schedule. So things like hepatitis A, rabies, typhoid vaccines, they're not part of the routine schedule, they are separate, and you would have to get them specifically. And often people think that they've had these vaccines, and they they haven't. The other thing is to think about the other risks that are non-infectious when we talk about travel. So for example, the risk of blood clots when when flying or even driving, right, for longer periods than four hours. Whenever you're stationary for longer than four hours, you have a risk of developing a clot in your leg, right, just from being stationary and your veins being stationary and the blood pooling. That blood clot, if it develops and travels through you to your lung, we call it a pulmonary embolism, can, can be fatal. So, you know, simple things like getting up every one to two hours stretching, walking, you know, flexing your feet in your seat, wearing loose clothing um, will decrease the risk of, of this and compression stockings. They don't have to be medical grade. But they We do recommend that they're below the knee. So anything kind of going up and above the leg is going to be a risk. And there's other risk factors associated with that, right? So it's worth having a discussion. If you have cancer, if you've recently been treated, if you recently had surgery, if you're pregnant, to have a conversation about special populations that are higher risk that we may not think about, right? Like people going on their baby moon, right? This is like a new trend that we're seeing is is women traveling when they're pregnant and 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 there's risk associated with that besides the fact that you might end up delivering the baby on the plane. Right. <laughs> I might not be there. So that's it. <laughs> And I would just have to say too, like I couldn't end this without making a comment about responsible travel and sustainable travel. And I think, you know, MedCan as a leader, we really need to talk about this and we really need to really encourage people to be respectful and responsible and look at more sustainable ways to travel. We know that, you know, the travel and tourism contributes up to 8% of the world's greenhouse gases. And aviation is responsible for 12% of carbon dioxide emissions from all transport sources. But when we talk about it, it's not just aviation. And a lot of people blame the aviation industry for a lot of what's going on um, with climate change. And yes, there's a component of that, right? And there are ways to decrease risk. And I don't know if you've heard, but France, for example, made the first political move in regards to banning short haul flights. So if it's a two hour flight within France, it's been banned. But I think tourism in general, right, is it's an industry that's projected to account for actually 40% of all 
global carbon emissions by 2050. And I think it's really important to look at really what is our impact of travel on climate change. And just to give you an idea, yes, there's transportation, but there's things like environmental pollution. And there's things like food waste. For example, if food were a country, it would be the world's third largest emitter of carbon dioxide. So think about the buffets that we go to and these resorts and these huge meals that we get to when we, you know, we're traveling. Really think about the considerations of, of what you're doing in these countries and the impact that it could be having. And if you think about it, unfortunately, the places that you're traveling to are the ones that are going to suffer the most right? Places like the Maldives and whatnot, when they're underwater because of climate change or when they're suffering because of the economic stability. And now, of course, we're seeing environmental things like sargassum toxicity and and seaweed toxicity. And if anyone's been to the Caribbean lately, you'll probably see masses and masses and tons of seaweed. And what people don't realize, it's actually poisonous. It's a a toxicity. And it basically, when it starts to rot within 48 hours, it, it produces ammonia and sulfur gases. And that's actually caused up to 18,000 sick people locally who are trying to shovel off this rotting seaweed to make sure people have pristine beaches. So considerations like that for yourself, but also for the locals, I think it's really important that we really think about how we travel, how often we travel, you know, and being mindful and purposeful about the travel. And I think people are like, there's definitely more of a trend for people to be more sustainably conscious, but it's just something to think about, you know, the impact of, you know, buying kichi souvenirs can have on uh, the local economy and the actual climate impact of of that. But I think thinking about purposeful travel and I, I, I you know, I'm not going to go into the details. I've written a paper and a publication on this called Climate Change and Travel. If anyone's interested in looking at the finer details of the impact of travel and, uh, on climate and climate on travel, it's a complex dynamic. And I think we need to be more aware and more educated about it. But at the same time, you know, you want to enjoy your trip. Um, but I think it's important to do it in a very responsible way. And and so that it's there for future generations to come so that, you know, your kids and our kids can see these beautiful places and, you know, experience these, these beautiful cultural experiences and eat this amazing food for years to come. Yeah, that's an amazing place to finish. And it's fantastic because we don't often hear that message. Frankly, these are these are issues that are just coming to the fore now. So we're going to require folks like you to be constantly reminding us about these issues. Lots of fantastic tips and tricks that you've provided for us. Um, you know, the influenza being all year round in the tropics. Love that jet lag treatment with light therapy. That's not something you often hear about. The CDC website, uh, obviously a massive resource for anybody who's traveling um, as well as your own uh, websites and Government of Canada. So, and of course, your local travel doctor, Peter. Don't forget us. <laughs> and 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 I was yeah, absolutely. And MedCan's travel service. We have a number of doctors. Any questions at all? The the first call can be to MedCan's travel clinic. So this has been great. Uh, Aisha, thank you so much for your time today. I, I actually feel much better about my return journey back to Toronto next week. Uh, so thank you again for your time. No worries, Peter. And I would have to say the things you need to be aware of in Ireland, just be careful about the Weezer fish in, uh, in the waters there. <laughs> Excellent. You don't know what I'm looking up. It's the venomous <laughs> fish on the beaches. So just be careful. <laughs> We're watching out for that. And to everybody, uh, stay well and safe All travels. Right, take care. Safe travels. That was MedCan's Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Peter Nord, in conversation with Associate Medical Director and Clinical Director of Travel Medicine, Dr. Aisha Khatib. To book a consultation with Dr. Khatib or another travel doctor at MedCan, contact 416-350-5900 or email clientservice at medcan.com. Follow MedCan on Twitter and Instagram and subscribe to us on YouTube at MedCan Live Well. We'll post episode highlights and other links you can visit on our website, eatmovethinkpodcast.com. Say hello and send us a tip or a suggestion by emailing us us at info at eatmovethinkpodcast.com. Eat Move Think is produced by Ghost Bureau, Jasmine Ratch is managing producer. Social media and strategy support is from Chantel Gerton, Andrew Imix, and Emily Bozik. I'm executive producer Christopher Shulgin. And we'll be back soon with another episode examining the latest in health and wellness. 
This podcast episode is intended to provide general information about health and wellness only and is not designed or intended to constitute or be used as a substitute for medical advice, treatment, or diagnosis. You should always talk to your MedCan healthcare provider for individual medical advice, diagnosis, and treatment, including your specific health and wellness needs. This podcast is based on the information available at the time of preparation and is only accurate and current as of that date. Source information and recommendations are subject to change based on scientific evidence as it evolves over time. MedCan is not responsible for future changes or updates to the information and recommendations and assumes no obligation to update based on future developments. Reference to or mention of specific treatments or therapies does not constitute or imply a recommendation or endorsement. The links provided within the associated document are to assist the reader with any specific information highlighted. Any third-party links are not endorsed by MedCan.